Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about starting the journey to unlocking building automation data. I'm Ann Cosgrove, the Editor-in-Chief of Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar is presented by OSI Soft today. Before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. Please note the control panel on your screen. This is where you can submit questions in the question box in that panel. Please send your questions in at any time, and these will be addressed after the presentation by your speaker. Also, please note the orange arrow on the left side of your control panel. Clicking on that arrow will either expand or collapse the panel, so please be sure it is expanded and you can access the question box there. If at any time you experience a technical difficulty, please send a message to us in that question section and someone will address it privately right away. If you're interested in continuing education credits for this session today, please note you'll receive a certificate of attendance in an email from facility executive after the event. You can report this to your association for CEUs. Now I'd like to introduce your speaker, Scott Smith. Scott is the industry principal for facilities and data centers at OSIsoft, and he spent the initial 15 years of his career in IT system design and operations for critical infrastructure companies in the electrical distribution, transmission, and power generation industries. Scott's focus then turned to the advancement of smart meters and meter data management with global utilities driving the beginning of the smart grid. Scott's focus at OSI Soft is taking the same lessons learned and moving this to smart facilities, a microcosm of the smart grid. So now you will hear from Scott, and uh, we look forward to his presentation. Hi, Scott. Hi, Ann. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, just kind of my only ground rule or kind of level set for everyone participating today. Well, you'll see the logo for the company I work for on every slide. Um, I will not be presenting a sales pitch or really even talking about our product or the company within the webinar. Um, this is more about identifying a tool that's part of the tool set and how to drive value in data. If you do have interest in understanding how my company solves that solution, please reach outside. Contact information will be at the end of the presentation. But I want this to be kind of independent of our product or independent of, of kind of that pitch. What I would like to discuss is the journey of how to find value from the data that already exists within your facilities. So our agenda will be covering what I mean on that journey to provide. Um, so let's define what that is. And I have three examples from customers I have worked with in the past with a, a mixed use of facility types from mis, mixed use uh, medical research or pharmaceutical research manufacturing class A office to a campus that includes everything from ther thermal power generation campus and, and a multitude of uses in that regard. So let's define the journey. <coughs> we have today on the left, and, and what today means, it's gonna mean something different for every facility. Um, now my experience, and it doesn't mean that everyone follows this method or, or is in this state, but today is very much focused on a re reactionary support model. Um, we deal with faults and complaints, we deal with projects, um, well, the facilities are typically meeting the demands or expectations of their customers. They are doing their best at balancing, I'd say, reliability, comfort, or condition requirements and efficiency to the, to the, to the best of their ability. Um, but I think there's a, there are definitely strains. Um, I see challenges that can range from aging infrastructure um, and specifically in all, and very frequently resource and financial constraints. Um, that really impede what you're capable or able, able to accomplish. Um, today, I think we have, many of you may already have some new technologies, but I see a challenge in what I typically will call the, the, the shiny, you know, the shiny object syndrome, right? We, the, the rage is fault detection or the rage is condition-based maintenance or it's sub-metering or, or it's something in the cloud, right? We, we kind of follow those market trends um, because it is that shiny object and we're all guilty of it at times, I think. Um, but I think what we lack or what we don't think about is a holistic solution that crosses the entire facility operations. Um, and, and this probably is a higher challenge in the more complex environments. If you're a campus, um, you know, building operations are sometimes a distinct service from thermal plant operations or power generation operations within that environment. So 
we have those silos. And I don't think we sometimes cross all of the silos in our organization. Now the future, again, I think the future is different for everyone. I do see trends towards things as we talk about like improved automation, predictive analytics, predictive maintenance models. Um, we talk about IoT or these device technologies out there that can provide us new sets of information. Um, and we see large scale corporate or, or organization objectives around sustainability. Um, in certain se sectors, we see a lot of talk about resiliency. And then we, we hear a lot about kind of the 360 degree facility. How do we have that 360 view of our, of our operation? So a bigger, a bigger approach to operating this. So, I don't, so there's no common journey between today and the future. I think there's common approaches in identifying the path. So let's, so, so today, let's kind of get a level set and kind of get a gauge where you guys are at and what you think. Um, I mentioned like on the right, one of your big balancing acts today are, are you know, comfort or condition requirements, the hot cold complaints, the reliability of the system and efficiency, that people can use the facility as expected, when expected and, and have that base. I think today's a little bit more complicated than just those three things. Um, to me, I think one of the largest challenges that we face in a facility organization is the lack of resources. Um, we may have the ability to add more resources, but the pool of resources really do not meet our demand. Um, or we have no ability to hire new resources due to financial constraints um, that really have never given us that adequate level of resources to do all the things we talk about in the future. We're, we're able to maintain the lights on, we're able to maintain a level of reliability that they're expecting, but that kind of, it stops there. But how do we capture things like those institutional knowledge of our resources that we've had for 20 or 30 years um, so that our future resources can do this? I think when we talk about resources, it's not, not staffing, but it's how we're going to use them and leverage them. Um, one constant is change within this industry. How we use facilities, how people work in environments is definitely changing and will continue to change. And so this does bring in this other part of our balance neck. We always seem to have ongoing projects. Either the building wasn't met to, or the able to meet changing demands and we have construction requirements or we have new facility construction. Um, but we always seem to have new projects and things that kind of pull at our, our time constraints as well. Um, but I think about, uh, so the biggest challenge to me is in the future is how do we change when we have such constraints? So how do we get to where our future plans are when we're balancing so many, uh, so, so many balls in the air just to maintain what we have? Now, when we talk about the future, um, again, like I said, the future is unique to everyone. And I think sometimes we will discount the future as it appears you know, light years away in regards, right? Sometimes we'll argue we don't even have enough metering today to do our, our, our job in understanding energy management, let alone how we are going to be net zero or really have a, a self-service model or, or be able to use machine learning. Um, but the marketing machine, the conferences, the materials we see out there definitely give us an indication that things are coming. And I've worked with customers where some of it is, their future is already here. Um, I happen to have a relationship with uh, NASA in Virginia where they have had no unplanned outages since 2015 by moving towards a predictive maintenance model, get away from time and even get away from condition-based maintenance and use the data in a way that they can have predictive. So their, your future may be here for someone else. So this is why we are all on a, in a different plan and a different process. Um, again, your future is not always decided by you and the facilities organization. Um, it can also be defined by the parent organization that you're, are, that you're a member. It can be decided by a regulatory or policy environment if you're a state agency or a federal agency. <clears throat> so we don't always have control over our future, but we're gonna have to meet those demands. Um, we still, in a lot of cases, run automation systems that are sometimes over 20 years of age. We have assets that may even be older. 
So it is very easy to discount the future as it's too far out to worry about. And I, I think we need to reframe or rethink that approach because it impacts some of our, our today challenges like resources. If we're going to hire and recruit the generation that's out there today, their, their, their number one tool in their bag is no longer a screwdriver or a multimeter or, or anything of that sort. It's, it's a phone or a tablet, it's information, it's being able to communicate and find value. They work in a different way and it's not a bad thing. But I think we need to recognize um, to even a focus on our, uh, our challenges today, some of these future things may help us be as that transition point for some of those, those issues like resource constraints and resource management. <clears throat> for me, and I, coming from a technology background in a data company, to me, the journey starts with data and information. Um, I, I happened to overhear a conversation between two facility operators, both in the manufacturing sector, and the one individual makes glass bottles and the other one makes cereal. And the one making glass bottles turns to the other one and says, I have enough money in my budget that I can buy a large air compressor, which I need, or I can buy software and put in the services and, and develop the data. And the guy from the cereal company looks at him and goes, well, that's a no brainer. And he goes, what do you mean a no brainer? Well, if you collect the data, you measure your performance, you can go get the air compressor because you can prove its value, reliability, resilience, whatever measure your business has, the information should be there to validate the purchase. If it's not, then you shouldn't be buying it in the first place. But that's just one asset. That same data will help you validate every asset in your environment. It may help you from a resource point of view, an energy management point of view, so you can solve your future problems just by starting with data. So step back and change that approach. So I agree with that. I think it starts with data. We recently completed a survey of 700 facility managers. 80% of them expect the demand for data to be greater over the next five years. Um, it can be from everything from internal processes, efficiency and sustainability to more regulatory like uh, reporting requirements, Energy Star, any state or city requirements on, on, on reporting energy consumption, could be federal policies and those types of things. So that the demand of data is going to continue to grow over five years. But if you look at how we use the data today, I think the challenge is that increase, that 80% over that the 80 think will happen over the next few years, it's gonna fall on deaf ears. When we ask that same 700 people, how often do you look at your performance data? So you can do efficiency curves, sustainability, fault detection, whatever. How often do you analyze your performance data? 58% is only upon failure, never or once a year. So in effect, the data is useless. A year later, how are you looking at something that happened within your mechanical system or your chilled water system a year ago? Or upon failure, it's a reactionary process. I asked the same group, how often do they analyze logs of system changes? Again, a lot of these people and a lot of you may outsource control, automation system support and have remote. So understanding what's happening is important. Again, 38% never look at the change of their systems or once a year or even something greater than that. Again, I asked them, okay, how long have you completed a cyber security assessment? Not that your risk may be any higher today as it was yesterday, but an assessment really gives you a tool of understanding your environment, but 57% have never completed an assessment of their cybersecurity risk or controls, even though they 65% outsource that support, which is, definitely in, in an industrial control environment, unheard of of that lack of assessment of security as well as that greater number of outsource. But I think that's an industry trend that's here to stay. And then the last is how many people have plans for smart technology? 65% across the board, no matter what technology it was, from light harvesting to automation blinds or you know self-learning systems, for the most part, we don't see a lot of adoption of these smart technologies. Um, so <clears throat> I think what we need to say is, okay, the data is gonna grow, but it's, if, we, if we need to change our processes and behaviors on our journey to start using it before it overwhelms us and it becomes inv 
have no value to us as an organization and it just becomes a problem right we're, we're collecting more using it less and it, that just becomes a compounding problem to our operation <coughs> so when i say data driven i think these first steps are and, and you have to pick for yourselves you can't pick them all um it's it's resilience it could be situational awareness or operational awareness across large spatial areas it could be geospatial awareness it could be fault detection diagnostics it could be around outsourcing everything from building automation maintenance to an esco performance contract um, we have condition-based maintenance sometimes it's just things like cmms we really need a better handle on our asset and work management systems um, we now have in a lot of places energy managers and they may have their own requirements outside of the control systems and environments and they want access to data independent of control um, so i think we need to identify <coughs> what's important to you so what i typically would advocate here is what i call think big act small meaning you may want to do all of these and they're in your game plan but the reality is you understand your financial and your resource restrictions. And if you try to accomplish too much or you don't have enough, they typically fail. So it's too big to fail. Sometimes it being big is the cause of failure from a project point of view. Um, so I think, think about it from a long-term approach. If, if, if I'm an energy manager and I have thermal plants or I have distributed facilities across the world that have different uh, mechanical and cooling layouts and requirements if i have multiple automation systems you know i can be complex i can be simple but i think the long-term approach is think about all those assets in your world from the business side if you're manufacturing or process driven to the systems of your mechanical and cooling to the use cases like you see on this diagram <clears throat> and even those future based like predictive maintenance or any of those future based things so picture that as your think big you really need to figure out a plan that incorporates those that will eventually be in the design. And when I say small, it's just pick. We, we don't start with the big bang approach. Um, and since you're resource constrained, pick one of these. Um, sometimes it's just picking you want situational awareness and the data will then tell you what the next step is. Maybe it's you have two disconnected plants on the same same campus. Maybe it's you run 500 retail locations across the geographic and you have no idea if people are showing up to turn the lights on and running your business um, facilities data tells us a lot about what our business and our, what our operations and are very critical to us providing those services um, so definitely identify the small projects to find value build momentum and get organizational support behind you but i think and this is probably one of the largest shortcomings within our space and that's what i call the marketing challenge the engineers that i come across are smart we solve problems every day the challenge is we're not really great marketers how do we you know sometimes we'll make a change and we know it had benefit but we never measured the benefit to show someone that controls our resource or financial constraints to show them the value and the savings or the opportunity or the improved reliability whatever that measure is um, we don't spend enough time understanding part of our job all of our jobs regardless of what role is selling what we do if i'm just a maintenance engineer it's selling to my boss that i'm i'm doing the tasks i'm being proactive i'm finding things if i'm the head of energy management i'm selling to my boss i'm finding efficiencies i'm trying to measure value if i'm head of plan operations again reliability resilience and cost i need to market above and it always goes up because at the end of the day our, we're in a resource constrained world because sometimes we are not using the tools and measurements to garner that greater support um, we just expect as long as it's on they're happy and we don't want to kind of say rock the boat or, or, or push that message or think they're not interested in hearing what we have to say <coughs> So I think- Excuse me, Scott, sorry, we have our yeah. poll now. I'm sorry oh. to jump in on you, but we do have our poll. Good. Um, and I'll call our attendees attention to that. Uh, and this is uh, reflecting on the slide and the data that Scott was just speaking about. So if you can all weigh in on with your experience, uh, the question is, how would you describe the way you've leveraged data to maximize the value available to your organization today? 
Are you planning to start? Are you scratching the surface? Have you found value already, but there's more to do? Or is there a long history of using your data in your department and, and beyond? So if you can just take a moment to cast your vote and share with us uh, where you're at on this uh, spectrum, that would be helpful to uh, Scott as well as the rest of the audience, I'm sure. And we'll show the results in a, in a few moments. Okay, so let's see. 40% uh, scratching the surface, um, followed Scott by 33%. Um, many have found value, but there's more to do. Planning to start 20%, and uh, rounding that out with the 7% of our audience has a long history of, of using their data. So there you oh. go, and thank you, everyone. Back to Scott. Perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and that, I think, I think that is, the bulk is definitely still just scratching the surface. I think, you know, these challenges, I'm, I'm listing some examples of challenges. Again, you all have your own challenges. And I will start with resources cubed and cost squared because between the two of them, that probably represent a lot of times 90% of the barriers that face us. And the rest are just noise in the system, but they're barriers. Um, but we talked about, this is a balancing act and defining the journey in the future state, we must acknowledge that you have these challenges. So first let's acknowledge what they are. Um, we need to think about a strategy to overcome the challenges. We just don't hit a wall and stop. That's just not who we are, and that's not what we should be. As, as, as these engineers, you've been constantly trying to solve problems that the facilities have posed to you for years. This, these challenges are no different than those. Um, I think, again, like I said, the most common is resources. And I think we forget, we must sell the value not only to those decision makers, but we must sell them down to our team members. Um, change sometimes there's this resistance so sometimes our own resources won't be on board to some of these changes or they see it as a threat to their job um, and I don't think any one of us thinks that there's too many maintenance people or engineers and we're going to have data and it's magically going to make people vanish and we're going to have less resources my history so far is the number of work order tickets exponentially goes up the more we use data by far there is more work than we've ever had before. But the more important thing, it's it's at a higher priority. It, it has a bigger impact on, on, on the value we're trying to do. So since resources, as an example, are a challenge, I would turn it around and look at it as the opportunity. Um, can we use data to automate manual tasks? Um, been facilities where the first hour and a half every day as an operator going through all of the screens of the automation system, looking for, oops, looking for make sure everything's up and running well data and systems can automatically do so can we can we any manual automation can we auto create tickets so people don't have to manually create cmms tickets um, can we change task priorities so people that feel like they're wasting time and they know something of greater value so i think your resources will engage more <clears throat> if you're able to take some of the things off their plate or make sure that they understand the priority of the work that's in front of them and it's an important um, can we use this to educate team members so that they can identify opportunities and garner, garner early support? One of the things, and I'm a, not guilty necessarily, but I'm in an association of guilt by being a vendor, right? We promise, you know, vendors like to promise the world, right? We are no magic bullet in, in any sense or aspect of the word especially when it comes to facility operations all facilities are different yes we, we we follow fundamental principles but how we do what our issues are and our challenges are different <clears throat> and as anyone walking in will never understand those challenges as well as the people that you pay every day to be there and, and view those um, so can we use this as a way to extract and get participation from those vendors so that or from those resources so they view that they're part of the solution and they're a team member versus just a task driven resource um, unrelated to facilities i work with there's an oil and gas company and they did deploy our software and that's as much but they when, when they talk about operators right they have a whole slew of engineers masters and phds and bachelors of engineering who will jump on the data but the person leading this exercise recognized that the operators who typically don't have a college degree, but have had 10, 15 or 20 years of experience at looking at the operations from a point of view, 
have a, an informal education in engineering and understanding. And so they were as much of a partner on this team as, as that college graduate with the master's in engineering was, recognizing that experience has value to the organization. And this was a way to prop these people up, but it was also a way to hold them accountable. They just couldn't stand to the side and call out names kind of approach, but they had to be a participating member, but everyone had value. And then last as a, or second to last as, a, as another resource was, can we use this as a recruiting tool? Like I said earlier, this generation sees technology more in the cell phone than the screwdriver. So by adopting maybe a data-driven or digital approach, will it be more in line with the expectations of the current generation that we're recruiting? So will we have tools that will encourage or participate? Um, I think sometimes when you look at plants and environments, it's hard to recruit people into some of our environments. Um, looks, you know, a dirty shop floor or an environment they weren't expecting when they got this degree. And then they're not all in clean, nice high rises designing the next big thing. We need a lot of people in a lot of places. So how can we use technology to do as a recruiting tool? And then lastly, can we use technology to move institutional knowledge to systems from the people that have them in their head? I think this is a big one. Um, if, I've, if you have a slew of engineers and maintenance staff that have been doing things for 20 or 30 years, the level of institutional knowledge that are not captured in the systems, <coughs> excuse me, is probably pretty high. So how do we, as a tool to encourage their participation and teach the new, can technology help drive by moving those into processes in the systems? So there are other ones. We have fears of technology resistant to change, organizations that fail to understand the mission critical value or nature of the facility to their operations. And we have owner tenant structure issues, right? If the owner pays for the, the, the cost of an efficiency, but the tenant gets the benefit, we have to find ways to overcome these challenges <coughs> because it has a, a, a better implication for all of that are involved. So how do we kind of pack for this journey? before we get into some examples. Um, again, think big, execute small. Think about your total environment, but execute in bite-sized pieces. Define measurable objectives and, and please verify and measure and so that you can market and share those in the future. Follow the data. Um, and this is why we should think big and execute small. Many times the data will tell you what's wrong in a way you may not have understood. Um, working with a, a university, um, they outsource their, their thermal and power plant and they run the facilities. They took a major power outage and were, were blind on the facility side for down for six hours, but they were literally blind because they had no plant data on power generation cooling. They had no idea what it meant for the buildings because the metering data resided there. So their first step that think big execute small their first small step was just awareness we just want to know what's going in the plant so when instead of having to run across a campus to figure out what's going on i can have a screen i can understand i'm not trying to micromanage or, or backseat drive the plant operations i just need some level of data to understand awareness the next thing the data told them was their outsourced provider because the contract on a service contract was ending was no longer providing maintenance to assets so when they said follow the data and they recognized a bulk of the data they were expecting was no longer being collected, they identified a performance problem in their performance contract. They were about to go to a 30 year long-term outsource agreement, never understanding that the current vendor may have put them at risk around their maintenance model because they're trying to maximize their revenue. So the data drove them in another way, changed their contract contracting process changed their outsourcing model in the short term while they started to remedy, remedy this. <clears throat> they, they then, the data gave them things that um, they were measuring uh, their diesel gen sets and then all of a sudden they found out they had a reporting requirement for emissions just on the diesel gen sets outside the plant. So these little, the data points started uncovering things that they kind of didn't expect or didn't understand. Next is invest in your team. Technology is not there to replace your team and your team should understand that. Technology is again, the tool for your team to use. So invest in them by giving them the time. 
we, we do hire a lot of consultants because we don't have resources and that probably won't change significantly. But maybe sometimes you, instead of hiring the consultant for the system, you hire a backup maintenance person or a chiller or an operator so that your employee that's there can participate in the project. So rethink some of the times who you're purchasing so that maybe your employees and your long-term resources can retain some knowledge and value and be, and be part of that project. <coughs> Prior, prioritize again, based on the value and the opportunities that you see in front of you. And then last and not least is market your value. You need to sell what you're doing, not beforehand requesting capital budgets. You need to go do things what I'll call in the dirt, dirty, down low. You need to go find value and show them that you're, you're changing the way the facilities are provided. Energy management's one measure, but we have things like resiliency, reliability, security, health and safety, air quality. There's several measures that we use on providing good facilities, but we need to make sure we measure in market. Our job is to change the perception of a facility as mission critical, and you do that by selling this model and getting a seat at the, the board table effectively. <clears throat> so, I have three examples of how data is driving value. Again, this is a journey. So these are just some starting points from three examples. And Scott, um, Scott yes. Go ahead. Dan, I'm sorry to jump in, but we have our second poll before you, before you dive into those examples. Uh, so we have that up on the screen now. Um, and the question, we again would like to, our attendees to uh, weigh in, please. The question, as you can see, is when it comes to the accomplishments of your department, how do you think the executive suite of the company or your organization views your role uh, at this point? Is a facility seen as a cost center, viewed as a partner to the organization, or do you think you're seen as a strategic member of the executive team at this point? So please take a moment to share your experience at, uh, in your, your role, and then we will again show the results. So again, seen as a cost center, viewed as a partner to the organization, or seen as a strategic member of the executive team. And then we will go ahead and show the results, and then we'll dive back into Scott's examples. So, okay, 41% uh, Scott, you can see there, uh, viewed as a partner to the organization. That's good to know, good to see. Uh, seen as a cost center, 35%, um, not surprising to me personally. And seen as a strategic member of the executive team, 24%, so that's great too. Um, thank you everyone again, and uh, back yes. to you, Scott. No, thank you. And it's funny, I was having this conversation, I'm at a district energy conference um, in Pittsburgh today, and I'm having this conver conversation, and someone asked me an interesting question, and they said, can you name a facility that's not critical to the mission of the organization? And I thought about it and I'm like, well, maybe if I have say drug stores and I have a thousand and I lose one, but effectively it's still contributing revenue to my company. So I, if there's one that's out there, it's probably we don't need it then. If we if we lease, we purchase, we build, we, we operate facilities because they are critical. And so there, I think there is a challenge in moving us from the, Viewed as, I mean, viewed as a partner is a good first step, but we are critical and sometimes it's helping them understand, you know, how, where, where would a Starbucks be if we weren't providing quality air conditioning, power and refrigeration for food quality and health and safety? Where, where would a hospital be without hot water, differential pressures, right? Those are, maybe those are easy to see. When you look at an, an office space, <coughs> I'm gonna pick one in, in Houston where I'm from, we had the uh, Harvey, and BP lost, I think we have the poll on the screen, is that true? Yes, um, Scott, you can tell yeah. us when you wanna see your next slide. Okay, let's uh, do the next slide. Do you wanna go to the examples? Yeah, let's next go to the slide. Okay. okay, let's see, we'll get into there. Um, sorry about that, just a moment. Oh, we're gonna wait for it to get up there. And we'll get into the, over to the examples, sorry about that. So I lost my screen sharing, that's not my screen. There you go. So you can just let us let us know next slide okay. when you want to move on. Okay. So an oil and gas company, skyscraper, a class A office space, basement flooded, so can, equipment flooded. So they lost their, their class A space. So, well, we, let's see. Well, all businesses will say we have a contingency plan. Maybe some people can work from home. Maybe we'll have additional office space in the same area, right? Well, first reality hit them was they do energy trading. Energy trading requires from a regulatory point of view, you record lines, you record the transactions. And so from a liability and risk, they could no longer trade assets they didn't already own. So they were in a position in a market of owning something they really 
are stuck with in a, a regard and from an oil and gas they trade oil commodities all day long every day so until they could move all of their resources from a trading point from houston to dallas and that's just not moving people that's moving families because your, your your employees are not going to leave their families behind in a disaster um i pick on federal government sometimes like if, if you say okay we're all working from home and then you have supply chain or, or you know you have the procurement department in one group but you have no access to them at home and so you 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 kind of come hamstrung because the people that you could walk to and talk to or the resources that you had um I, we use ip phones but the, the ip switch is in the office so if we lose the building we lose our phone system as well um <clears throat> we don't think about all the little things that are tied to that facility from an office space to a hospital to an airport to a Starbucks retail establishment. So I, I think we definitely need to make sure people understand that and, and continue that marketing process. So I'm, I am happy to see 41%, um, happy to even see 24% of strategic members, but I think that 76% that definitely needs to continue to move up and help educate and find value so that they can move up. Um, okay, first off, Eli Lilly. So, this is a multi-use space so from manufacturing to office space to medical research and laboratories where we have environment conditions pressures and things like this um, project was led by their energy manager so not the facility control or operations team he recognized they have no standard energy report or monitoring um, they definitely are as a global company will have different climates as well as different design philosophies across the world um, definitely see that, that Europe uses a different mechanisms um, and then being anywhere from the Bay Area where you may have cool to hot to Houston where it's always hot and there's no need for an economizer um, <clears throat> to the Northeast where sometimes there's enough cool air to drive things or, or Northern Canada where you can use mostly outside air. We have to recognize there's all these environments that are going to cause when we look at data that drive different reactions. Um, so their goal was let's find an, a, an energy monitoring dashboard to look across the enterprise. And they had a, they had a, oops, oh, next slide, sorry, I'm trying to click. And they, they had noticed that when they looked at the data, they, in the control system, they were seeing performance problems, but in a control system, a couple things have to occur. One, are you licensed for data beyond 90 days? Are you licensed to have raw data um, versus PDF or, or far? Have you turned on trending per tag and every tag that you need so that you have a history? All of these things they started running and and then when you wanna compare, say as an example, 600 hair handlers and compare all 600 against each other, trying to do that in an automation system is a pain in the butt. So, but what they noticed was they were seeing an issue. And if you think about it, I mean, the most of the energy savings in any large facility you're gonna find through your air handler process. So they started building, first they started with a, a, a monitoring dashboard, something quickly that they could put up to understand kilowatts per ton. They could look for ones that were definitely behaving differently than others. So, you know, example here, one's almost twice the kilowatts per ton as one next to it at a similar load. Um, so are, like, are they like make and model? Or what, what are the conditions that would drive different behaviors so they can start looking at that? So next slide. So when they start to drill down, um, and this is why a really good example of think small. When they looked at the air handler, they're literally looking at, I think eight or nine values plus some uh, valve statuses, right? They're looking at return air, outside air, mixed air, uh, preheat, cooling coil, supplier and a supplier set point. And, and this is the fault you actually notice. And when you look across all of their air handlers, this was not an uncommon fault at all. But with a return air temperature of almost 74 and an outside air of 42, if you had the proper damper percentage, you would be, it would be completely feasible to that your mixed air your economizer should meet your set point of 67 degrees. So just pure math calculating this, you could know that this should be at 67 degrees if it's right. So we have a damper issue that's causing um, uh, too much outside air 
mixing in the mixed air and we're losing too much. So we're now 10 degrees beneath the, the supply air set point. Then, okay, that, but then they noticed that the preheat fault had a five degrees. Okay, I'm ex all right, I am 10 degrees below my set point. I would expect preheat to raise to set point, but the valve's closed. So either the automation system did not trigger a heat command or the valve's broken, but I know I have a five degree change. So I'm assuming at this point, the valve is broken or some unit or some function is broken. So, okay. So I have the second fault. I know I have a damper issue. Now I have a heat valve issue. Second, I lose six degrees on my cooling coil, but it's valves closed. So I then just, just my supply air is 59 degrees, eight degrees below. So now I'm gonna probably have to have what five times increased energy consumption by using electric reheat at the terminal units for something that should have cost me no chilled water or hot water. And it should have met just through mixed air and damper percentage. I am now spending five times my energy cost because of these systems. And these systems cross multiple air handlers. Next page. Um, so Eli Lilly's main campus, campus is in the Indianapolis area. So on the main campus, um, they were eight to 10% energy savings from the deployment. Um, they've actually calculated looking at prediction models and historic data that they have captured in weather normalization across the world, they will be able to save. There's the low safe bet is 8% energy consumption across all facilities globally. Just by looking at the simple faults around air handlers and chilled, and chilled water, hot water, and, and the damper percentages. Now, you're like, well, we could measure things like the terminal units and the, the reheat processes. Um, we could look at a lot of other things in fault detection. Absolutely. Um, but their goal was the biggest bang for the buck was looking at eight values and finding 8% savings. Now, every process after this is not gonna have that 8% savings or taking a big chunk up front, but this is going to build momentum for them. <clears throat> the other thing this built for them was when you think about all those facilities, they're not the energy managers are not the facility managers. So they didn't wanna be a burden. So they did energy managers develop this themselves. They created the what we'll call templates and math, the, the fault rules and the analytics. And when they went to the facility manager says, look, we just need to install this small piece of software to get these 10 values out of your system. It'll have no interface. We, in this case, I think they used the, they used the BACnet interface they got 10 values <coughs> and there was no workload placed on operations or maintenance. Operation maintenance were happy. Operations and maintenance took a little challenge, but they were fine with it when they recognized the CMMS ticket load actually went through the roof when they ran the analytics on each facility because we, we just identified issues that had to be fixed. Data wasn't gonna solve the problem. It was just gonna identify the problem. But at the end of the day, when the energy consumption dropped back 8%, they were all happy. Um, their next step is adding those additional fault rules and moving forward with building out a model that is, you know, think big. So now they can just add those additional models into this mix um, and continue to grow this process and, and definitely going out and marketing and promoting their energy savings across the board so they get senior level support. And next slide. So San Leandro, is uh, just a pure class A, kind of small space. We wanted to pick facilities of all shapes and sizes. Um, each building there, those are just two of the buildings shown. They're roughly about 135,000 square feet. Um, and there'll be multiple buildings with apartment complex and other mixed use spaces built into this total square footage of this place. Um, but they started with what we'll call efficiency in design, right? The old headquarters, which is just out of this picture, ran at about 26 kilowatts per square foot. The new building was designed at eight and a half kilowatts per square foot. So by and large, they're spending less energy on more space than the old headquarters by, by, by multiple factors. So do we really need to put in process, brand new building, efficient in design, those types of things? Next slide. And the answer is yes. Um, what I would say, post-commission analysis. Um, this happens to be our headquarters, so we could definitely look and do this. <clears throat> but right out of the gate, we found post-commission problems. And I, I think that the fundamental flaw goes back to how we build buildings, right? We, we set a design target 
we decide how many people are in it, we decide what type of level of efficiency it will have, and someone's gonna go build a building to that spec. They're gonna bid out the building, and then all the bidders that uh, respond to those proposals are going to do the least cost option to meet the minimum threshold of the building. So they're not gonna go, we're gonna give you 20% more energy savings than you asked. No, we're gonna give you exactly what you asked at the lowest cost possible. So how can they, they, do they cut corners in the process? Absolutely. Is the design spec that a commissioning agent gonna do later spot on? No, it's missing a lot of things. Um, so there's, they, they expect that there's just gonna be this cleanup process. It's a natural occurring thing. Just recognize we're not delivering everything you, you need, just what you asked for. <clears throat> so in our, post condition analysis. I mean, the low hanging fruit was there. They installed broken equipment. They installed thermostats on the on the on the ductwork themselves. Um, they we had a, a pressurization issue on the first floor because they had a floor to ceiling return that had an issue with the first floor. We had all kinds of problems. Um, one of them was when we when we started looking at <coughs> in our infinite wisdom of being a California company, we allowed our users to have control of their temperature settings. Uh, so from 68 to 74 degrees, users could control any thermostat in the building. And nice concept, two problems. The building is designed to operate at a set point. And when they're not maintaining that set point and we have variations, we actually created simultaneous heating and cooling zones by having with our open concept based on one person hot, one person cold. <coughs> And a lot of problems were purely diffuser issues that were just aimed incorrectly. Um, second, they implemented no global reset. So when a person changed the thermostat, it stayed at that thermostat during occupancy from now to someone else changed that thermostat. So the building could never get back to its own design standard. Um, third, we had what we'll call a smart algorithm automation system that would learn how to precondition the building prior to occupancy in the morning based on its pattern. Well, when we have so many people changing the set point and no global reset, the building didn't even know how to run its smart algorithm because we kept having changes constantly. It really needs a stable set point environment <coughs> and performance environment to build its smart algorithm. And every time you change, it started over. So we've created a challenge for the software and automation. Next, well, in the first step we did, we did do some manual global resets to test the building. We reset the building to 73 degrees and lo and behold, all of our comfort and complaints went away because um, the complaints were really driven by the deviation. So complaints went away. Um, there were still adjustments, but we were, we were uh, <coughs> still had challenges in the building. Um, and then what we noticed when we went back to the design documents, the, the building was designed for 72 degrees, plus or minus two degrees. So lo and behold, we've been giving users access to 68 degrees. So by just looking at the data and then challenging the data, we we're able to start understanding post-commission issues that were never thought of in this process of putting it together. Because the, there is a disconnect between a design, the owner's initial and the commissioning engineer who's sitting in a room somewhere remoting in and trying to commission a system. <clears throat> it doesn't all get documented. So there's definitely gaps in, in that process and system. Next slide. Next for us, we, we definitely decided to do new technology as a technology company. We put in effectively dynamic glass. So four levels of tinting based on solar location <coughs> and then self-adjusting for say cloud cover and current weather conditions. Um, like all good things, we initially allowed our users to override the window tinting. Um, but that created a challenge because the window tinting actually saved us 25% tonnage capacity on our HVAC system. And our wisdom of our developer, they reduced the tonnage we purchased by 25%. So we had no buffer to handle the window tinting system not working when turn, people turned the windows off. And so it didn't take long, but we removed <coughs> that override access for that. Next, we notice is a new technology. They had no human machine interface. We couldn't actually measure why windows were tinting or not tinting. We couldn't find warranty claims. We couldn't find code issues within their system. <clears throat> so we had to build some displays and take the data that was available via BACnet. Then to force them to understand that they had, we had really a sensor issues, we had cloud cover issues. And so it took us 
well over a year, but we work together as a partner because I think you should treat your vendors as partners. So we work together to find solutions. We've upgraded sensors. We've improved the quality of the system. Excuse me. <coughs> so I think, again, first step, we wanted to post commission. We wanted to see the data in the, in the next slide. Um, and so the next slide, again, we're a data company. So we wanted to look at the data and look at it from a machine learning point of view, really to understand that self-learning automation for uh, preconditioning. Um, and the building was, in, in my mindset, was really acting weird. We'd start at 3.30 in the morning, um, sometimes 5.30 in the morning. But what we noticed that if you looked at the data holistically, the building got to temperature two hours before anyone got there. So at 5.30, 72% reached set point. <clears throat> so, okay, probably too early. We need to kind of tune the schedule and understand, but 28% of the points never got to set point temperature. So we also had a problem. Um, the data started underlying telling us, okay, why is 28% not getting? And it led us through investigations of like the, two, the 68 degree differential. Um, it also identified a lot of faults. We had a lot of damper issues. So that floating point just kind of got out of whack on our damper on our on our system. So the data itself explained well, we could probably do better in cooling our own building and we could probably do better in finding faults. And so this was the beginning of fault diagnostics for us. And so this is an example where the data is telling us where to go. Um, again, I'm trying to provide a comfortable, reliable space for our employees. Um, so these are just things that we're using as a way to start understanding how to provide those services. And then the last slide on this, <coughs> this site is, and you can change slides, is about this new world of IoT sensors and kind of give you a kind of a reference I, when I when I look at doing changes, say new visualizations, adding data to my automation system, right? But it won't be used in an automation or a control algorithm. That's expensive. It's expensive to add things to systems that are, for the most part, um, not open source, not an open network protocol like a, a Honeywell Niagara. It's that are proprietary systems, restricted protocols. So when I want to do changes, it costs me a lot of money. And when I want to do those changes and they're not in the control algorithm, why am I paying a lot of money? <clears throat> so as we talk about sensors, we need to really understand things from air quality to level of lights. We weren't going to use this for any automation algorithm. <clears throat> we were going to use this to understand comfort and impact on our employees. Um, one, we wanted to understand how conference rooms or large specific spaces were being used. So we use sound and motion to really under and light to understand when certain rooms were occupied and how long the lights were stayed on. So it was our lighting methodology for um, use and for especially in the state of California? Did we have the right shutoff when people leave left the room and those types of things? Second, we had a, a new building we built next door and we had now a reflection issue. Um, we wanted to really understand how much light was coming in off the building we just built, how much light were we <laughs> taking off the LED system in the building, could we make lighting changes to make it a little bit more comfortable for people. So effectively for $150 we created a portable troubleshooter. We, we weren't at the stage where I want to deploy IoT sensors everywhere. I think that stage will come as we think about um, air quality and, and well building and these new standards, I think we will have more sensors that are outside of automation in the future. But I just wanted a simple Raspberry Pi system with nine or 10 different sensors where I could place in a facility and start to understand what's going on and bring that data back <coughs> and then integrate it with the automation data to give me a sense of what's going on from that point of view. All right, the last example on the next couple of slides is uh, UC Davis and they've done a lot. And so I can't even begin to talk about all of the things they do. They're a very smart group of individuals. Um, they spent a lot of time finding what's right, validating, measuring. But these are some examples they had shared with me recently I thought were interesting. Um, <clears throat> the first one is really, you know, when you're responsible for steam, chilled water um, and electric distribution, 
on a campus, really understanding how those commodities and services are being provided. You, you have metering, but do you, how, how well are you, is your system metering? Are they calibrated well? Um, how do you find anomalies? Um, are you running some type of regression algorithm against data to say your meter's bad and those types of things? They did an interesting thing here. They, they did an energy balance on their building and they compared the energy balance against outside air temperature. And they developed a curve where you expected performance <coughs> of the building. So when you see in the, that middle top, perfect curve, chilled water is the blue thing going up based on outside, you know, heat, you know, you have your, your hot water temperature, steam temperatures. But when you look at the building on below, you see like on the left, the slightly deviation from the curve and in the middle bottom, you definitely see a, a big, deviation from the curve it never continues up and the same with the 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 energy demand that you the btu demand that you see in the far right grass <clears throat> effectively this could be faults with a building but in reality this was faults with metering so when you look at the data you can really identify if it's a meter issue versus a building issue if you have no complaints you have your maybe you're maintaining temperatures but, but you're not looking at maybe your delta T or you're not looking at some of your flows or pressures, but you can, but everything else looked right. So again, this is a way to identify meter quality if you have a large environment. I thought it was kind of unique, something out of the normal um, in validating if we have calibrated meters. Um, but again, this is just taking data. The next example um, is, you know, they don't have the luxury of some commercial buildings where people badge in and understand occupancy and, and it's not a defined work schedule where everyone works eight to five, eight, eight to five, eight to six or nine, whatever. As a college campus, you have diverse uses of facilities. <coughs> um, so what they did based on how people work today with tablets, phones and laptops and Wi-Fi, they introduced the number of connection, Wi-Fi connections on each access point is a data set into their facility operations. So that's that white line. So now they can see how the, when the space is being used. And then what they're looking at <coughs> is the demand of steam and electricity against Wi-Fi. And they've noticed in several places, <coughs> excuse me, that they could make schedule adjustments to their automation based on use of the buildings. They've also used this type of data to work with professors who thinks you know, the building may be used 24 by seven and it's really not. And it's really ways to, again, they're at that fine tune stage. They've been using data for a while, but th this is an example of the data is telling them where to go just by looking at these things and finding these different anomalies. And then the last piece from UC Davis is really building a, a kind of a Delta T. So those with chilled water uh, systems, you know, when they first looked at it and they're just looking at baseline, um, load and flow, they, you know, the load was, oh, we have less than 10% have a really bad Delta T. 26%, eh, we still need to make improvement, but 10% is not bad. But when they realize when that 10% flow turns into 30% of the total flow of all chilled water, you have a problem. So now it gives you where to start identifying your, your what what's available to you is, you know, the pumping demand, you know, how, how much adjustments in the building versus the system can you make to adjust that? Are there other things that we need to do from a chilled water point of view? Because <clears throat> this thermal energy is expensive. And so this was a way to get started and looking at some, again, continued big picture things. They also do have energy storage up on the right. So they are ways, they are able to compensate by doing with energy storage and discharging during peak times. But again, we still need to focus on where that 30% flow is causing us um, performance issues on our efficiencies of systems. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. And let's just go to the summary and then let's open it up for some questions after that. Um, again, uh, solutions about our, our summary is about repeating ourselves. So only you know your challenges. I as a vendor may have an idea. We may follow some industry patterns and things that we see that are common amongst them but you know your challenge specific to your environment. And what you need to identify is a solution that fits your needs and not fitting your, your facility into the, someone else's function. No two facilities are alike generally. And so you need something that's adaptable and adoptable, scalable and, and small enough 
to start small, think big, but fits with how you operate your business. Um, so really think about that. We, we, we are not the magic bullet, we're a screwdriver. Just make sure you're picking the right screwdriver. Again, small measurable objectives. It's about finding value <clears throat> and marketing that value to your stakeholders. This is one of our biggest shortcomings as an industry group is that we're not selling our services enough, high enough to get people to understand how we impact facilities. And you don't wanna be the one that's marketing the exact opposite of this, of some colossal failure, right? You don't wanna be the campus that had a student die. You don't wanna be the hospital that had all the embryos become unfrozen. You don't wanna be target and facilities where someone hacked your credit cards because they got into your facility operation. You don't want the negative marketing to impact your view because then it'll be quite evident but you wanna find the positive one so that you can change that relationship and have that better seat at the table and avoid the management by crisis situations that then will drive, it'll drive investment, but sometimes not be very fruitful for everybody. And then last and not least, follow the data. Um, don't assume you know everything about your systems and the data. The data will tell you to go places that you haven't thought about looking before. And just recognize it's, it's a new opportunity to look and think about what's going on and it may underline things. And it, it, it's, it's a tool of engagement you can use with your own employees and following that data and investigating what's going on. So that's my uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, discussion on the journey. Um, and we do this, I have a lot of conversations constantly and, and it, it's different for everyone. So just take a, take a moment, step back and think and think how what you could do within your environment so that you move from the 35% seen as a cost center more towards that strategic member. Um, really trying to articulate how you're integrated to that mission of your company or your organization. Um, Anne, why don't we uh, see if there's any questions from the attendees? <coughs> sure, thank you, Scott. And uh, thank you to our attendees for, for the questions. Uh, yeah, we do have time for a few questions. So. I'm going to kind of uh, jump on, piggyback onto your conclusion there as far as the, the big picture of, uh, you know, using data for, to tackle the different challenges and the various challenges that are unique, obviously, to, to facilities uh, and organizations. So I want to just start with, um, with a question about combating inertia or getting started. You had a slide packing for your journey. Um, so, you know, the question is, um, what are some of the, what are some of the ways to actually just get started? Uh, you know, resistance to change is a, is a big deal, um, even beyond funding and things like that. But um, and as you mentioned, reactionary, uh, you know, there's always putting out, putting out the quote unquote fires in facilities. So how would you suggest um, a facility leader or, you know, their teams get started on this journey of maximizing data and starting to follow the data? Um, two things. I think one, talk to your own team members, find opportunities or things to start at. Can you measure with the tools you have, or do you need new tools? Um, if you need new tools, I think it's this is where we need to treat vendors like partners, and partners need to treat customers like partners. It's not a one-way street; it's a two-way street. And find, say, what I what we'll typically call proof of value. Why don't we come in and work together to find value that'll allow you to move forward, and the mutual benefits of finding that value versus trying to sell you up front and hoping you succeed because you bought something. I think if we change our relationship in the, in the industry to think about technology providers as partners <coughs> and they think you, and they also change to think you as partners, I think it's a good way to start by definable, clear, closed scope, um, proof of value where with or without a technology partner, but you go find value and can kind of demonstrate how you can make a change in your environment. Thank you. And uh, a lot of, stay along those lines for a moment, and I'll ask you the question that um, is asked here. You know, I agree the resources, uh, such as people, you know, team members, and funding are our challenges here, um, in, such as implementing you know, a data system or data tracking system. So how do you propose we would start when we have such fundamental challenges? I know you just mentioned those tools, of <coughs> talking to your team, talking to your vendors, um, but when people and funding are those, those challenges, um, what other types of um, conversations do you think are valuable to have? Well, I, I, uh, what's the analogy of the chicken and egg, which one comes first? Um, 
I think there's one constant we know. Everything we know about facilities is going to continually change. The demands placed on us will change. The, the expectations of facilities will change. So if we do nothing, our world's gonna change and we will have no control. <clears throat> so we need, at some point, you know, you kind of need to just step back and decide that you're gonna go do something and you can do it, you know, I've worked at all levels of an organization. You can do it, well, okay, with, you know, with, and I, I'm at a loss of the term, but kind of, you know, underground, kind of like a little militia thing, go solve a problem without people knowing it and then sharing the results. No big cost, no structure, and show people that when you have initiative, you've involved the right people, you're building momentum from the bottom up, those types of things. Or others is, trying to start that education process, getting people understanding the value, that it's definitely a longer haul. But if you do nothing, we know these, we, we know that the current generation of facility managers are going to retire. We know that recruiting new ones are more difficult every single day. There's less available from traditional sources like the Navy. We have less people going to, more people going to universities versus trade schools. <clears throat> So we know this problem is going to compound quickly. So we do need to recognize this is an example of a tool that we can use to help that resource. And just how do we bring all the things that are impacted or into this relationship together to help solve these problems? Thank you. And uh, we just got a, a question in. We're going to stay in this vein. Um, can you elaborate on getting corporate leadership to accept the value of facilities? Uh, I concur with your presentation, but our facilities are under the finance department and always review and always review only as a cost drain on the company uh. so if if and without knowing what you do i'm going to give you an example right if if you're a manufacturing facility and you lose a facility it's very simple and easy for them to say one lost day of production costs the company x from revenue to cost right and, and it's assignment and people will understand it <laughs> when it comes to class a space um sometimes it takes that that industry failure for someone to wake up and, and that's not the way to learn. So part of it is, it is our job is, and, I, and I'm a parent and even as a parent, right? My job is to sell to my kids. I just can't order my kids to do everything I want. My job is to sell why they should do something. It's just the same to the finance department. Yes, they're focused, but we also need to understand what their drivers are. are. Are we having a capital intensive process issue right now? Are there are the revenues down? What pressures are applying in their environment? So I should know how to work around them and not, you know, sometimes I'm, you know, it's like your child asking you, I, oh, I wanna buy this nice big thing for $200 right after you paid the largest bill you have, like your annual taxes and you don't really, so you need to understand their environment so that they can understand your environment. Two, it's take them out of their environment they're, they're, and bring them to a facility or bring them to with a partner to understand the strategic nature. Run some scenarios. What if, if we were to lose this facility, what are our backup plans? What are our costs? What are our risks? Um, and then, but you know, again, it's, it's relative to the people that are, are they willing to listen? Are we able to communicate effectively? But we have to find a way to communicate. We have to find people that'll be willing to listen um, and not give up trying. So there's a lot of what ifs in there and it depends on the people and the roles, but it, 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 part of it is, and I, coming out of IT, 25 years ago, IT was a pure cost center. We were not part of the vision or core of an industry. Today, the CIO sits at the table. Technology is driving business. Um, so we've left that cost center mentality and, and are part of that mission. The, I think depending on the facility, some conversation will be harder than others, but we have to have that same one. You don't want to be the person on the news when someone steals $40 million in credit cards, when you lose a freezer that lost embryos, when you're the casino that got the casino system. There's starting to be too many negative examples. So you don't want to be that person when that happens to be the way that they realize how important you are to, the, the, to their operation. Thank, thank you, Scott. And I like the point you made about uh, talking to finance and seeing what, uh, you know, seeing their perspective uh, of what's going on with them because, which is they'll share because then that does help uh, the communication, lines of communication. So thank you. Yep. Uh, okay, well thank you. Uh, it looks like we are out of time. So I wanna thank you again, Scott, for the presentation. Well, thank you, appreciate everyone. A lot, of, a lot time. of great information. Yes, and thank you to uh, the attendees for your time and for your participation. Uh, we will 
have this, I also of course want to thank OSI Soft for sponsoring the webinar. Uh, so the recording of this webinar will be available online uh, at facilityexecutive.com. Uh, you can also go to the OSI website and that's osisoft.com and check out the presentation in the near future there as well as to learn more about what the company uh, does. So also I just want to put a, a little note out there that if you are in the Washington DC area this fall, Facility Executive Magazine is hosting a one-day conference on September 19th, and that's in Arlington, Virginia, on the George Mason University campus. You can learn more about that at the conference sessions there and the exhibiting companies at facilityexecutivelive.com. Uh, thank you again, Scott, OSI Soft, and to all our attendees. Have a great afternoon. All right. Thank you.